Have you ever tripped over your dog? This, this particular image, this meme made me laugh. I'd like to think that I'd die a heroic death, but it will probably end with me tripping over my dog and then choking on a spoon of frosting. Or the cat. You're trying to walk, the cat is constantly underfoot, and this is what they're thinking. Heading to the kitchen, I'll run to get in front of you, and then stop. And this is the result. How many times have our pets intended to be a help? They just want to be as close to us as possible, but they end up getting in the way. Can that happen with people? Turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. It's page 828 in the Black English Standard Version there. Uh, First book of your New Testament, Matthew 23, these four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, if you want to find a record of what Jesus said and did during his physical lifetime here on earth, you look to the gospels, the first one, Matthew, uh, chapter 23. And let's, let's see this morning. Let's see if we can't begin to, to figure out initially what is this situation in Jerusalem? Okay. We're, we're in this series of messages that is taken from the final week of Jesus' earthly life. Uh, we're still on Tuesday. Jesus is at the temple. He is teaching, and he turns to the crowd that's gathered here, starting to listen to him, and he begins to speak. And this is Matthew 23, beginning with verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call them rabbi. Now you know you know that these guys are within earshot. Okay, they're they're standing over here. There's this group of guys with these extra long blue tassels on the corner of their robes. These are the guys with the extra wide leather strap across their forehead and these little boxes. What were these called? We have an image of these phylacteries. That this just a little box of scripture. It's fastened to your forehead, and obviously the, the larger your phylactery box is, the more scripture you can put in there, then clearly the more spiritual you are. And it's the same thing with their tassels. Everybody was walking out of a tassel. Everybody was instructed to wear tassels on their robes. You read the, the commands from the Jewish people, God's word. This is all the way back in Numbers fifteen thirty seven. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. You will have the tassels to look at so that you will remember all the commands of the Lord. But but these guys just have to make sure theirs are longer, were thicker, more impressive. I don't know, I don't know if they ever tripped over their tassels. This is kind of an ironic side note. You know, only God can do these things. I've shared before that my through the Bible in a year reading plan, it has four sections. You know, the Old Testament, and then like the Psalms, and the Gospels, and the letters. And I just go down those concurrently each day. Over 300 readings for the year. 300 breakdowns. And these two references that we just made, Matthew 23 and the Numbers passage, are one day apart. You read this Matthew 23, and you think, oh, that's impressive. These guys have these big tassels, and and that's Pretty amazing. And then you read the next day and it points me to the numbers passage like, no, I'm not impressed. Everybody is supposed to have those. And this situation in Jesus' day has become problematic. This is just one more expression because Jesus acknowledges, yes, these guys sit in Moses' seat. You know, they, they, they're in the chair. They are on the stage. They have the pulpit. They have the mic. They're the ones that are doing the speaking. They're the ones with the access to the scrolls. So yes, when they read you God's words, listen. When they speak God's truth, do what they tell you. Just don't follow their example. 
And if you want to read the remainder of Matthew 23 this week, uh, the lion's share of this, uh, verses 13 and following, it's a long list of woes. Jesus is pronouncing on these very leaders, and he tells them to their two faces. And you can just read with me just a couple, like verse 13. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Are are those strong words? Yes, but it's a serious problem. These guys, maybe, maybe initially they intended to come alongside, but now, more often than not, they're in the way. They might have wanted to become helpers, but now they're barriers. And sadly, this problem isn't limited to First century Palestine. Uh, When people have this, we call this debate the the faith versus religion debate. And the problem that Jesus is pointing out here in Matthew 23, it's part of that conversation. Have you ever had a friend, you ever had a co-worker, and they'll tell you something like this, I I don't mind Jesus, it's the Christians that confuse me. And sometimes we joke about that in here. Oh, I love the church. (laughs) It's the people I can't stand. I'm all for faith, but these... Thousands of churches and hundreds of different religions. That I could do without. I'm a spiritual person. I don't need church. There was actually an ad in the print in the Advocate for a local funeral home. I cut it out and saved it. Not a member of a place of worship? Do you consider yourself spiritual but not religious? Would you prefer to be in control of how religious a remembrance service should be? We offer services provided by certified celebrants for funerals or cremation. Our celebrants have been specifically trained to design a service that is completely personal, incorporating those unique stories, songs, and experiences that defined the individual. I read down, I thought, hey, wait a minute. I tried to do that. I tried to do it yesterday. Had a funeral. Dan Bauer and I shared together. Dan did the same thing. Heidi did a fine job. I don't know, Dan, maybe this little side business for you. you know? If you don't want the hired gun 40-hour week guy, you can get the, the volunteer retired celebrant. And I, I'm kind of making light of that, and I'm kind of not, because I do kind of take that a little personally. But I think that illustrates the potential that exists. Sometimes we preachers and rabbis and priests and leaders and celebrants can start thinking, we're here to come alongside. Then it goes to our head, the pride bubbles up, and we just get in the way. And and if you meet one of these people, they're struggling with that debate, that faith, religion, then all of a sudden these verses 8, 9, 10 and following that Jesus speaks in Matthew 23, this makes a lot more sense to them. Because here's Jesus now speaking to his crowd, and he says, "But, but you're not to be called rabbi. If you have only one master and you're all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. You can't miss the humility thing. It's been mentioned now eight times in a row in the last two weeks. You know, What's at the root of of people wanting more attention and more adulation than they deserve, that's pride. So is is Jesus here suggesting that no one's ever going to need help from a preacher or a teacher or a parent? No. I hope not. I'd be out of a job. But that's also part of the problem. I hope I can convey that what I do here is more than just a job. I mean, and I think the service that Jesus is mentioning in 11 and 12, the humility that has been shared several times, that is an indicator. Any leader, any, that's how you make it clear you lead as you serve. You know, and in, in this exact, this kind of thing, it became problematic with the televangelist scandals. When were those? 80s, 90s? Remember all the, the guys on TV and, and the problems? I, I looked up the YouTube headlines. What are they saying now about those things? It says, televangelist, quote, God says we need another private jet. <laughs> I'm sure he did. Uh, 
And I listed, I looked at another one. This is the headline of the clip. The top 60 craziest Christian TV preachers. Just the top 60. And no, I didn't look at the list to see if I made it. I didn't. <laughs> I don't want to know. You know? Unless you think it's an issue of the past, it's now, I wish that were true. I'm in the van on the way over to Indianapolis on Monday, the National Preaching Summit I've attended for years. I love those two days, conference, seminar, speakers, workshops, excellent infusion. And I'm in the van and there's eight preachers, so we talk as preachers do. And they start talking about a church, a big church. It's not southeast, okay, but it's a big church in Kentucky. And, and I knew the church, recognized the name. And, and I knew the minister that served there for a long time, very faithful, um, trustee of the college. He had retired, recommended a new man. And they started talking about the new man and what has happened to the church in these last few years. And these guys are talking about how the, oh, well, you heard the preacher change the bylaws. How did he do that? He just changed them. And, and then he made himself and his wife and his best friend, the elders. How did he do that? And then they started locking each other out and this and that and said that a member had passed away and given $180,000 to the church in their state. And the preacher took 100000 out of that, put it down on his house of his $530,000 mortgage. Like, how did he do this? And they keep talking and I think, you guys got to be making this up. You know how preachers exaggerate. You know? <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm... I look it up on my phone in the van and news report after TV after everything they said was exactly true. The church is now locked and the judge has ordered some representative, whatever they call him, you know, this guy's in charge of the building and the locks and everything. While the sides hash this out. Three lawsuits back and forth. And you think that particular congregation is going to very well be able to come alongside somebody right now that's looking for Jesus and help them? I think not. They're going to be in the way. And mind you, verse 9 is not about not calling your dad, dad at home. You know, don't tell the kids, oh, can't call your father anymore. Hey, old man, that's not, that's not what that means. You know, there's, there's always going to be a need for authority, leadership, instruction, whether it's at home or at church. But Jesus said, followers, you call each other what? We're brothers. We're sisters. We're all siblings. I was sharing uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 in a conversation Friday. We're all part of the same body. We all have equal access. Christ alone is the head. It's not me. You know, I want to help. I, I want to bring sermons and lessons and, and post things that will help clarify and instruct but don't let me get in the way. You know, I, I want to come alongside you, but you don't have to run everything through me. That's how I get in the way. And Max Lucado was writing about this particular passage. He said, how do you simplify your own faith? How do you get rid of the clutter? How do you discover a joy worth waking up to? He said, simple. Get rid of the middleman. Discover truth for yourself. Develop trust for yourself. Discern his will for yourself. So there are some who want to position themselves between you and God. There are some who are going to tell you the only way you can get to God is through them. There's the great teacher who has the final word on all Bible teaching. There's the father who has to bless all your acts. There's a spiritual master who will tell you what God wants you to do. Jesus' message for complicated religion is to remove the middleman. He's not, again, he said, that doesn't mean that we don't need teachers and elders and counselors, but we're brothers and sisters and we have access to the Father. This is Hebrews 4, 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, all of us, so that we can receive mercy and find grace to help us. Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the time had fully come... God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God had sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. You just as much as me. Max Lucado said, you have a Bible? You can study you have a heart? You can pray. You have a mind? You can think. 
No, and hopefully us religious folk will come alongside you, but please don't let us get in the way. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause right here for a minute because there's just one more little tiny blank left. This, this final root, it's the same concept alongside, but not in the way. And it's a different, we're going to have a different person in the crosshairs for a minute because I hope you've enjoyed the opportunity to kind of you know, put the preachers on the spot for a little bit, but I'm going to take that mirror and I'm going to turn it around. Okay, Look at yourself. Home, work, school, ask yourself this question, where am I? And, and I'm going to guess that you're going to initially say, well, you, you think just like I do. Well, naturally, I just come alongside people. I help them. I'm an asset. If we pull all the people in your circle, will they have that same conclusion? Or will some of them say, eh, no, well, really, sometimes you're in the way. You sit down at your company computer Monday morning and you pull up your work email and 86 offerings for today fill up. And you scroll down through there and one catches your eye because it's from a coworker who's about three stations down and she has a question regarding why do we do this the way we do and you know how your pulse just kind of blood pressure a little bit, hair on the back of your neck. Cause you know why we do that because you're the one that thought that up. Because you had the same questions you had years ago, and you went through all the efforts and the explanations and the the solutions and tried all of them and failed with most of them and the sweat and the pain and the tears and all that you went through, and this is your idea. And now here she is, you know, the golden child just taught off the presses, and she's questioning everything, and she's got a new idea. She wants some input. You going to come alongside, or are you going to be in the way? Or your mom and dad had a lifetime together. It was a beautiful lifetime, but it was too short of a lifetime. Now, faithful people, you know full well that your father will see your mom again in heaven, but for now he is hurting. He misses her. He's a disaster around the house. (laughs) And he's tried for eight months, but he misses your mom. And now he wants to bring her into your mom's house. Apparently she and your dad dated in high school and some well-meaning friend reconnected them. And everything you've heard is positive. She's faithful, godly. Children are upstanding. Nobody wants the money. You going to come alongside? Or are you going to be in the way? Or your kids. <laughs> Can we talk about your kids? Well, this is Pamela Spinney, Innisburg Falls, Vermont. She's sharing with Reader's Digest. My five-year-old Matt worked with a speech therapist on the ch sound, which always came out k. The therapist asked him to say chicken. He would always respond with kitchen. Every time she tried, it came out kitchen. Undeterred, she pushes him one more try. Matt sighs and goes, why don't we just call it a duck? <laughs> and that's one of those things where you giggle a little bit and then you think, well, I'm, we're the parents and our little one's struggling with speech and language. Are we going to come alongside and get them the help that they need or are we going to, nah, we can get it. We take care of this ourselves. He'll grow out of it. Pride gets in the way. You know, teachers and coaches call these helicopter parents. Oh, no, no, I'm just coming alongside my child to help. <laughs> no, you're landing right on top of them. You know, you're, you're, you're not actually allowing them to develop their own skills. Truth be told, you're in the way. You know, do you need to resist the urge to ask him about that particular project yet another time? He knows the deadline as well as you do. Let him suffer the consequences of not turning it in. Make her get her own alarm clock. Maybe she's going to sleep through work some morning, and she's going to have to experience that. You Are, are you really coming alongside your new daughter-in-law by making your son's favorite dishes just the way you make them and just popping into their house two or three nights a week around dinner time? That's a clear one. I hope you're in the way. Okay. 
Are you able to, this is tough for me, are you able to resist that urge to immediately look up what your daughter asked about? Because she came to you with a faith question, and don't get me wrong, you know, we're, we're certainly glad that they're willing to come and they're asking something about the text, and this is a teachable moment. But if I'm looking them all up for her now while she's home, trying to be alongside her, is that going to maybe some way be in the way when she's grown and gone and now all of a sudden she doesn't have me standing right there to do all the research immediately? I just feel like this is one of those concepts. It's a whole lot easier to see more clearly how someone else is failing than it is to look at myself in the mirror. You know, to appreciate, to understand, to Realize it could happen to me. That's one of the first and best steps to ensure that I'm truly serving. I'm not self-centered. I honestly want to come alongside my kids, my parents, my siblings, my friends, my coworkers, etc. I really want to make sure and ensure that it really is about them. It's not about what I want for me. And the Pharisees lost sight of that and Jesus called them on it in no uncertain terms. Whatever the arena of life, telling the truth, responsibility, consequences, work ethic, marital commitment, faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I want to make every effort to come alongside what I have to ensure I'm not in the way. Let's pray and we'll close. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for opportunities where you have afforded us Experience, uh, intelligence, education, information. We want to be help, to be encouragement, uh, to be assistance. Father, we pray that we would not somehow lose sight of what the goal is and be hung up on how people perceive us. We pray that we would be able to have our eyes open to those times when maybe in reality we're in the way. We pray that you would help us to make the changes that are necessary. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And we will encourage you again to consider your own decision. Maybe this is a day that you know personally you need to allow the Lord to do what only He can do in your life. And this invitation is for you. Let's stand together and we'll sing. 481, come just as you are. Well, God did tear it. He did allow another week for you to hear the gospel. So if you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, do so now. He'll meet you where you are. Come just as you are.
appreciate your being here with us this morning. Thanks to all the folks who were a part on Tuesday and Wednesday for taking pictures, and thanks to those who tried to have your picture taken and they were running late. That's not your fault. So I appreciate all that effort. If you did not get a picture taken and want to submit one, you certainly can send us a picture of yourself, your family, and we'll add that to that directory. And for today, I know uh, Stephen and Ryan are going to meet with the parents. If, if you have a middle schooler or a high schooler, right here in about the next five minutes, just come up here in front, uh, have some information to share for high school and middle school going forward for the next few weeks. So, I don't know, you have anything to add to that? Uh, just that the students are welcome to be in that. Okay. So we'll students. try to get it in sponsors also, but we'll try to get it done before Sunday school starts. It okay. looks like it is set in the on Sunday, so. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You are welcome to imbibe in that, but yeah, get all that stuff together and quickly. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Would you close the prayer, Stephen? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. God, thank you for each person here. God, we pray that uh, you just give us the, the strength and the servant uh, to come alongside uh, our brothers and sisters and friends. God, and just, uh, just make sure that we are doing that well. God, that we're not uh, jumping in front and letting the past go alongside and helping those uh, just get closer and see you. God, we love you and we thank you. Jesus, our Amen. Amen. I love cinnamon roll Sunday, so that's for most of the strength is perfect. <laughs>